Tristan Clavery, who will talk to you about uh, Laurent One Security. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. So I am Tristan Clavery, and I will talk to you about uh, some work that we did with my colleague José López Estevez on uh, LoRaWAN Security Assessment Test Bench. So José and I are working for the National Cybersecurity Agency of France in the Wireless Security Laboratory. In this laboratory, we are studying uh, security of radio communication protocols. We are also doing some electromagnetic security like tempest or intentional electromagnetic interferences. And we're also doing signal processing, uh, simulations, measurements. Um, as for me, I work specifically on the radio communication protocols part and specifically radio communication protocols dedicated to the Internet of Things, so IoT. And uh, when we put all those words together uh, and we search on the Internet, there are numerous protocols that are related to the IoT. So this is by no means an exhaustive list, uh, but th those are some uh, words that come often. So today the, the topic of the presentation is LoRaWAN, and this is what we'll talk about. So the presentation is organized as such. So first I will present to you what LoRaWAN is, uh, what kind of protocol, its architecture, etc. We'll see uh, what has been done before, especially on the security side of things. And then uh, we'll see uh, the shortcomings of the state of the art, in particular when it comes to tooling and existing test benches. And this is why we created our own test bench that we present today. So we'll see the available hardware and software to work with LoRaWAN on a radio level. Then we'll detail uh, the, the test bench that we used. And we validated uh, this experimental setup uh, using several experiments. And one that we did is re-implementing uh, an existing attack, which is called replay or decrypt, and we'll detail everything. So first, what is LoRaWAN? So LoRaWAN, maybe you've heard of it. Uh, it's part of the low power wide area network family. So it's a protocol that is dedicated for uh, small devices, usually sensors that have um, not much battery, not much power, and which must uh, send data over very long distances, so several kilometers. Uh, the main use of the LoRaWAN network today is smart metering. So sensors just communicate their data, humidity, temperature over the LoRa LoRaWAN network. And this data is aggregated by uh, software applications somewhere in the internet. The protocol is specified uh, openly by the LoRa Alliance. So they have a website, you can download the specifications. Uh, everything is open. If you look at uh, what's a LoRaWAN network, uh, it looks like this. So first, at the bottom, you have end devices. So those are your sensors. They are communicating uh, over the radio with gateways. And gateways are just transmitting the data to servers or so gateways. They are just interfaces uh, between the radio layer and the IP layer. And there you have a LoRaWAN core network, so you have several elements in a core network. And this network is talking to applications. So when we're talking about a LoRaWAN network, whether it's public or private, we're mentioning a set of gateways which are connected to a LoRaWAN core network. And when we're talking about a LoRaWAN application, it's uh, an application that runs somewhere in the internet and which aggregates data from several sensors. And we have one limitation, which is that one end device uh, belongs to only one application, at least at, on a logical level. So of course, uh, we're here to talk about radio. So we'll focus on one we can do at the radio layer. So whatever happens between end devices and gateways. If we look at the protocol stack over the radio, so we have something like this. Um, first, we have the LoRa modulation, which is owned by Semtech. And then almost everything is specified by the LoRaWAN specification. Uh, so we have the what they call the file layer, which is kind of described, but it has been reverse engineered. 
Um, and well, they call it phi, it's more like a link layer. Uh, and then you have a Mac layer and application layer. So here you put uh, all the data that you want to transmit. And uh, a note uh, regarding bounds. So in Europe, the LoRaWAN network is deployed uh, at 868 megahertz. Uh, recently, there was the addition of the uh, 433 megahertz band. So another thing that we need to know when we're working with LoRaWAN is the difference between uplink and downlink messages. So uh, the modulation is a kind of frequency modulation. And this is, this is a real capture. So when we are plotting the instantaneous frequency of two different messages, namely uh, above uh, an uplink message, so from an end device to a gateway, uh, we see that the data is modulated on upshifts. And when we are plotting the instantaneous frequency of a downlink message, so from a gateway to an end device, the data is modulated on downshifts. And if we look uh, from a protocol point of view, uh, what happens when a device wants to send data to an application? The device and the network have a set of preferred security parameters, which are uh, stated here. So this is for LoRaWAN 1.0. It's a bit different in LoRaWAN 1.1, but the idea remains. The device and the network uh, go through a handshake phase. So join request uh, and join accept. After this step, they both derive new security parameters and the data between the device and the application is protecting using those new security parameters. And there, the network is just transferring the data from the device uh, to the application that does not modify it. Uh, so mainly it's smart metering. So the main use is uh, data coming from end devices to the application, but occasionally the application may choose to answer to some, uh, to some messages. Also, the device, uh, if it wants to uh, reconfigure its radio parameters, it will send MAC commands and communicate directly with the network. So uh, now that we've seen a bit what is LoRaWAN and how it works, we'll see uh, the, the state of the art and specifically what was done on a security level. So there have been several attacks. Uh, the first, which, have been, which has been uh, independently reported by several teams, uh, is the desynchronization. Basically, it's how to perform a denial of service between a specific device and the LoRaWAN network, so it affected version 1.0, and it came from a flow in the handshake protocol. Then there is a replay or decrypt attack, so we'll elaborate more on that later. Uh, another interesting result is that gateways can be spoofed by an attacker, so either an attacker implements a gateway to an end device, or so a radio gateway, or an attacker implements a gateway to a network, so an IP gateway. There has been a formal analysis of the handshake protocol, so uh, which demonstrated the, the flow in LoRaWAN 1.0. Uh, there have been several studies regarding jamming of LoRaWAN communications. Uh, and another very interesting study is about uh, biasing the random number generation using intentional electromagnetic interferences. So there are studies uh, on that. And there are also uh, some studies which detail how to do bit flips attack on the LoRaWAN network. Uh, two other interesting presentations. So they do not describe new attacks or new theoretical attacks, but they describe existing test benches uh, to play with LoRaWAN at the radio layer. And so there has been those two presentations in the first one. Um, they stated that they are able to sniff messages and replay messages, and they used those two capabilities to first re-implement the desynchronization of devices, so the first attack <coughs> on the table, and uh, they also tried to perform some denial of service on the network. And there is a second platform which we do not have much information, which is able to sniff uh, packets over the air and to dissect them. 
So when we did the state of the art, uh, we could see that there were lots of attacks that were proposed. Uh, most of them are applicable to the radio layer, but there are uh, only few implementations. And when we are reading the papers, uh, we did not find enough details to assess the exact uh, risks that are posed by uh, each attack. So we do not know exactly what are the preconditions. Is it hard to do? Is it not hard to do? Does it require some specific setup? And so uh, we try to reproduce the attacks in order to have our own idea of it is hard, is it not hard, and is it a risk in a live network or not? And there were no uh, details on the experimental setup. So we couldn't, we couldn't reproduce the results. And so we came to the conclusion that we had to re-implement the results if we wanted a, a good view of what is LoRaWAN security today. And this is why we had to build our own platform. And uh, this is what we'll present now. So how do we work with uh, the LoRaWAN protocol on a radio level. So first we have the modulation. It's patented by Semtech. It's a kind of frequency modulation and uh, basically depends on two parameters which are the bandwidth and the spreading factor. Uh, modulation is open. You can find it uh, about anywhere on the internet but the coding of the file layer was not. Uh, first when we want to work with the protocol, we are looking at uh, development kits, development boards. And uh, so we looked at hardware LoRaWAN modules. So a uh, hardware LoRaWAN module is just a LoRa transceiver plus a LoRaWAN software implementation. And the interesting thing is that with a development board, we usually have a full hand on the Mac layer of the LoRaWAN protocol, which means that we can put anything on the Mac layer and above. So if we manage to have access to this LoRa Mac layer, we can have a software re-implementation of the LoRaWAN protocol. Now, uh, we also have some uh, projects related to software-defined radio. So we have our first uh, blog post on Myriad RF by Josh Bloom which presents uh, how to demodulate LoRa signals. Uh, and we also have uh, two reverse engineering work on the, of the file layer and the, the coding of frames, which have been done first by Matt Knight and by Peter Robbins. Uh, those two people have implemented a GNU radio project to demodulate LoRa signals. Uh, however, there is only the one by Peter Robbins, which is complete because uh, not only does the modulation, it also does the decoding of the frames. So we have the, actually, uh, the actual bytes that are transmitted. It has some limitation though, which is that we have to use uh, exactly one block per channel and that a single block can process only uplink transmissions or downlink transmissions, but it can do both at the same time. Now, so those are the kinds of elements that we used in our test bench. So our exact test bench is this one. First, we have a development kit from microchips. So this development kit is composed of one gateway, one LoRaWAN gateway, and two LoRaWAN end devices. Uh, and there is also a package core network in a Docker container, which we can run on a, on a host computer. And if we put everything together, we have a complete test LoRaWAN network, so a real complete network, which we can provision with uh, devices, which, uh, with applications, and we can see which data is transmitted uh, to which device, how we can answer, etc. So we have a real and live LoRaWAN network to test and experiment with. And if we are communicating directly with the LoRa modes, we are able to talk to the LoRa transceiver and so we are able to forge our own LoRaWAN messages. Another board that we used is uh, the FiPi, so it's a multi-protocol development board which is made by PyCom. It supports five different IoT networks which are LoRaWAN, Sigfox, LT, Category M1, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy, and Wi-Fi, so it's very powerful. 
And the interesting thing is that it runs a MicroPython environment. So when we connect to the board, we have a Python shell. And through the Python shell, we can communicate to the LoRaWAN module. And, uh, well, we can communicate to the LoRa module and to the LoRaWAN stack. And using this Python shell, we are able to implement uh, complex scenarios on the PyCom uh, by using its own hardware. And what's even more interesting is that we have access to internal timers of the PyCom, which means that we can have a precise synchronization by using those internal timers. Uh, it's even possible to turn the PyCom, uh, the FiPy, into a single channel gateway. And there is an existing script uh, to do that, which you can find on the internet on the documentation. And finally, while well, we used an RTL SDR plus GNU Radio, and especially the GRLORA project from Peter Robbins, so we could uh, use it to capture signal and process them. We could use the GRLORA project to decode LoRa transmissions in real time. Um, and we performed a small modification on the project such that we could listen with one bug to both uplink and downlink transmissions. Therefore, with one GRLORA block, we are able to capture a complete handshake. Basically, we used uh, the RTLSDR, GNU Radio, and GRLORA to debug the modules, debug their LoRa and stack, and understand the, their behaviors. Something that we can do with it is implement a multi-channel decoder. So this is a simple LoRaWAN sniffer. So we have our source, uh, the RTLSDR. At the um, right, we have uh, three different uh, LoRa decoder in parallel. And in the middle, we're doing a channel uh, channelization by hand. So uh, we just don't convert the signal. Uh, basically, the parameters that you see here, bandwidth, spreading factor, uh, and the channels, uh, they are all standardized parameters. But with this flow graph, we capture uh, the majority of handshake occurring in an area. Now, a uh, more complex case study is the replay or decrypt attack. So we'll explain a bit uh, what it is and how it works. So. This attack has been published by Avon and Ferreira, uh, and it has a rather high impact because we are able to partially decrypt some messages and we can replay others. Uh, further, there were no uh, mention of any implementation of this attack, so it's very well theoretically described, but we did not know before this study if we could uh, play it uh, for real. So. We, um, we experimented with it and we used it to validate our platform. The idea, so I won't get too detailed, but basically after the handshake process, uh, the messages between the device and the application are protecting using the AES uh, encryption algorithm in the CCM mode. And AES CCM uh, is a very secure uh, uh, mode of encryption because uh, CCM mode has been formally proven. However, its uh, security proof relies on one assumption, which is that two different messages must not be encrypted with the same security parameters. And if it happens, then the security proof falls and we have some attacks which we can do. And so the, the idea of the attack is we will uh, play with the handshake process of uh, LoRaWAN connection to force a non reuse in the handshake messages such that security parameters would be reused across two different LoRaWAN sessions. So if we have uh, security parameters reused, basically we have a key stream reused. And if we look at how the messages are encrypted, so it's uh, messages are absorbed with the key stream before being sent and when two m different messages are encrypted under the same key stream, we can XOR them together. So this is called a two time pad attack. And uh, the key stream just XORs itself, so it's zero, and we get the two plain text XORed together. So this is why it's only a partial decryption, it's not an, a full decryption, because 
we do not have uh, all the information, but if we know if we know some elements about one uh, messages one message or the other, then we can infer more uh, elements about the other. So there are uh, two variants of this attack which are detailed in the paper. In variant A1, we are attacking an end device, so we can partially decrypt uplink messages and we can replay downlink messages. And in uh, variant A2, so it works the same, uh, just we are attacking the core network and the, the impact is symmetric. So we can partially decrypt downlink messages and we can replay uplink messages. Here. So uh, here is how the attack uh, is implemented, how it works basically. So we say at the beginning that we have captured a complete session. So we have one join request message from the device to the network, one join accept from the network to the device, and we have a certain number of messages which belong to the sessions. Well, we have captured uplink messages, captured downlink messages. Now uh, imagine that the device wants to reconnect to the network. Here, the attacker will send a corrupted join accept or it will jam the legitimate join accept. Basically, it will prevent the device from uh, completing the handshake with the network. The effect of that is that the device will just try another time and it will try again and again and again and at some point the attacker will see that the device tries to attach with a nonce, so here we took uh, 0x1234, but it's random, which is the same nonce that was used in the, um, in, the, in the captured session. And if at this moment the attacker sends the captured join accept message, we have the device which um, derives new security parameters, so he thinks they are new, but, but in fact it derives the same security parameters as for the captured session above. So basically here we've won, and so the device then th sends uplink messages which we can partially decrypt with the, with the messages we've captured, and we can also uh, replay downlink messages that we have previously captured. So the implementation, basically the setup is the following. So we, to, we take every element that we presented before and we put them all together. So we have our complete test LoRaWAN network. Uh, we have an attacker which is uh, implemented by the FiPi. And we have an RTL SDR and GR LoRa which monitor uh, what's happening. And so we can verify that the, the attack is, that everything is going uh, as we predicted. So basically the attack is implemented on the FiPi uh, standalone. So the FiPi first uh, capture a complete session. Then we manually uh, reboot the device that is targeted. And then the FiPi will uh, detect when there is a non reuse and complete the attack. So it takes about 100 lines of MicroPython and this is the second version because we tried first to implement the attack using uh, software defined radio plus a LoRa mode, uh, but we had synchronization problem and couldn't complete. So overall, uh, with our setup, uh, the attack took several days to complete, so several days with a device trying to join a network every 10 seconds. Uh, it may seem like a long time, but it matches theoretical um, expectations of, uh, because it needs on average uh, 2 power 15 messages to uh, reuse a nonce, so for the device to encounter a collision. So those uh, several days are expected. And uh, we uh, chose to power out the gateway because um, we did not want to actively jam the uh, 868 megahertz bomb. So finally, uh, this is another uh, rather interesting result of the project. So we used uh, GR LoRa and the RTLSDR and waterfall diagrams uh, to debug and observe the behavior of LoRaWAN stacks. 
So th this is, uh, these are some things that we noticed. Uh, for the LoRa mode, when we are trying to communicate with it um, directly, and we want to transmit several messages in a row, the first message, uh, the first message is transmitted at the proper frequency, but the next one will be transmitted at the frequency you see there. So we we saw our messages disappear, and we didn't understood why. Uh, for the PiPi, Pi, it's a bit. Um, we need to be a bit uh, used to it. Uh, basically, the LoRaWAN stack tends to crash, uh, but the PiPi doesn't tell you. Uh, so when the stack crashes, uh, the PiPi uh, continues working. You still have a working micropath environment, but the LoRaWAN stack doesn't work but the PyPy lies. So when you are trying to send a message, it, it will do, it will write just like it sent a message for real, just like it tried to connect to a network, but in fact it does nothing. And so again, we used um, GNU Radio to, to verify this. We also could see some uh, differences of behavior between uh, the two devices when they try to join a network. For example, for joining a network, the PyPy uh, tries in the background and doesn't tell you anything. So if you are trying to manipulate the LoRa part while the PyPy is trying to join a network that doesn't exist, basically you will make the LoRaWAN stack crash. And the LoRa mode, when you try to join a network but it fails, uh, it just says that it couldn't and you have to manually try again. It doesn't do anything behind your back. And for those that are interested, uh, the last two bullet points are for turning the devices into gateways. So as a conclusion, uh, we tried our best to have a proper state of the art about LoRaWAN security. So if you're interested, go follow the links uh, there in the paper as well. We described a complete test bench with every components uh, and software that we used. Hopefully, uh, we have enough details such that uh, you should be able to re-implement our testing infrastructure uh, on your own laboratory. And uh, we used this setup to debug the behaviors of LoRaWAN stacks. And this combination of software-defined radio and hardware modules was very efficient because we were able to implement complex scenarios uh, in a really short time, really efficiently. Uh, and so it was, a, it was a very interesting project to work on. So now what we could do is optimize the GRLORA implementation to correct those synchronization problem. We could also try to further implement more attacks, especially uh, attacks regarding intentional electromagnetic interferences. Or we could uh, use the platform to try to develop a detection system about whether there is something happening right now on the LoRaWAN network, can we detect it or not? And we could also uh, try to develop and share some test vectors to see if uh, the network or devices are uh, susceptible to specific uh, attacks. And we could also uh, use our, our platform to study commercial devices if we wanted to uh, work with uh, real and production devices. Thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Yeah, th thank you for this presentation. Um, I have a question regarding the standard. So there are apparently a lot of issues with this uh, protocol. Uh, is it possible to amend the standards and can you do that even if the solution are already deployed? Um, I didn't mention that, but a lot of the issues that have uh, been discussed uh, in previous research have been uh, patched in the version 1.1 of the standard, so it's still under deployment. I don't know if as an individual you have the leverage uh, to do such modifications, uh, but Actually, they worked with security researchers before for th uh, uh, the, the patch, so the, the patch holes. Uh, 